Hello everyone, welcome back. We are at Canto 28 of Purgatorium, one of the most important cantos of the entire Divine Comedy. Italian students in Italian schools have to study, have to read this canto every time they study Divine Comedy. It's always part of these Divine Comedy anthologies that are published in, uh, in Italy for schools for good reasons, because it's the first canto of uh, the Garden of Eden, of the third portion of Purgatorium. And this uh, third portion is opened in an extremely beautiful, delightful way by Dante, but uh, not in a, in a unique or separated canto. These uh, six cantos that separate us from the end of Purgatorio are in fact uh, a single uh, narrative unit from 28 to 33 in Purgatorio. And they all have a similar pastoral, bucolic and, uh, um, aspect to them, and also they are full to the brim with uh, allegories, with uh, um, high poetry images, um, less philosophy and much more myths and, uh, and symbol, symbolism. There would be so much really to analyze and dissect them, all these six uh, coming cantos, but I'm also reminded that uh, while it's great to enjoy the fine meanings and the little details of, of this great poem, it's often uh, a risk to get lost into the analysis and miss the forest and miss, no pun intended, and miss really the beauty, the enjoyment of the poetry here, because this is poetry to be enjoyed. Uh, given that it's so, given the theme, this is poetry to read with with quiet and call um, listening while listening to Beethoven's sixth, the pastoral, because Beethoven was in fact uh, thinking about very similar images when he wrote his sixth symphony. Streams and nature and birds in the in the trees. These are um, what the images that Dante is uh, referring to when he wants to delight our senses, especially with the first part. This uh, Canto 28 is pretty clearly split in two in parts. The first one is so dramatic and lyrical, and uh, in my opinion at least, it's the best part of the canto because it kind of assaults us with uh, so much novelty compared to what we've seen so far in the Divine Comedy. Beauty of a certain kind that we maybe haven't really found in the Divine Comedy yet. And the second part is almost, uh, um, it's more quiet and it's almost scientific in uh, its uh, um, explanation of uh, weather and uh, logistics and geography of the Garden of Eden. So I would say the second part is uh, just as beautiful, but in a way that reminds me more of uh, Cantos of Paradiso, where there is a lot to delight the mind for, and so it's an intellectual delight, while the first half of this canto is a delight for our senses. It's a delight for our eyes, the vision, the sounds, uh, the smells. Uh, it's, a, it's a feast. It's a real feast. On this particular point, um, Robert Hollander, who is one of the translators of the Divine Comedy and um, one of the most prominent uh, Dante scholars, he had to say, an allegorical temper can steal the joy from any poem, uh, which I find a really interesting uh, point, and, and it's true. Let's not, he's saying, let's not get too bogged down with analysis and, uh, and understanding what all these allegories in the next uh, six cantos mean and what really Dante meant. Um, not as much that we lose sight of the beauty, of the immense, incredible beauty that is contained in, in these coming cantos, because it's really outstanding. So I'm going to zoom in into the first tercets in Italian because they are quite uh, rich with significance and uh, with terms and uh, utilization of language that is very difficult to translate into English. For example, even from the very first uh, term, vago. Dante uses vago to say, to mean something that in uh, multiple translations I've seen as keen or eager which are perfect, perfect uh, terms and it's a good translation. 
Vago, though, in his uh, meaning, is used and chosen by Dante because it conveys the meaning of a free desire. He, it means a, a very uh, a person full of desire, but this desire is free in him, and that's really the point that Dante is trying to make here. He is now sovereign and king of himself, like Virgil has crowned him, and uh, it's not dependent on anybody. Remember, still, the, the other two poets, Virgil and Statius, are following him, but the focus, the spotlight is on him here because he's uh, finally a spiritually completely independent individual and person. So, vago, vago già di cercar dentro ed intorno la divina foresta spessa e viva che gli occhi temperava il nuovo giorno. Very sweet language, very sweet cho um, choices of, of words. And uh, a couple of highlights. Vago già di cercar dentro ed intorno. He is uh, free and and curious in a childlike way because he's almost regained his own um, innocence. And this is why he's using uh, terms and adjectives that are reminding us almost of, of, of a child. So in English, Mandelbaum says, uh, now keen to search within, to search around that forest. Why would Dante say both within and around? To convey this, uh, this uh, joy and, of, of being curious and being free to follow this curiosity. La Divina Foresta, the Divine Forest, is now, which is an obvious um, reference to Canto I of Inferno, where we had another forest that we all, we all remember, uh, it's, uh, it's now Spessa e Viva, which uh, is an interesting choice of adjectives because um, Mandelbaum says dense and uh, alive with green. Okay, it can be translated in many other ways, but uh, uh, it, this spessa e viva has the same length and the same type of uh, number of syllabs that um, the adjectives for the forest in uh, for the woods in Canto One of Inferno had. And these adjectives were aspra e forte, aspra e forte, bitter and strong in a in a negative in a negative way. Now, the woods is spessa e viva. So, in this entire canto, Dante is really turning the page, finally, from uh, Inferno 1. And listen to this third line, which is impressive. Che gli occhi temperava il nuovo giorno. He's uh, talking about the woods, the forest, and it, it's tempering the new day to his eyes. So it makes you really imagine visually uh, the, the, these rays of light that are cutting through the foliage here and there and moving in harmony. He is... Uh, Free and uh, Mandelbaum says without delay. This is another example where the Italian doesn't really translate perfectly because Dante says senza più aspettar, without waiting anymore or without being dependent anymore. And, and that's really the point that he's making rather than without delay or something that would um, imply any type of rush. He doesn't have any rush. In fact, he is moving lento lento, which is a beautiful alliteration. He's moving at his own pace, not dependent on Virgil's pace. How many times so far Virgil has turned around and said, come on, let's go, we have to go, we have to go. Not anymore. Dante is his own man right now. Also here he says, prendendo la campagna, lento lento. La campagna literally is, means the countryside, the country. Mandelbaum says, I took the plane, advancing slowly, slowly. Nothing to say against this type of translation, but uh, Dante is looking, is making us look at a countryside image. So in our memory, we should go back to what countryside is for us to really enjoy this line. Uh, super lo suol che d'ogni parte a oliva. A oliva is a beautiful poetic term that in itself means uh, to be fragrant. So I don't know if there is a verb in English, um, there probably is, that is, you know, in itself means to be fragrant, but uh, Mandelbaum doesn't use just one single verb. He actually says every part was fragrant, while Dante says this concept in just one word, auliva. So we have visual, we have light, 
we have um, olfactory senses and um, there is no there is no stress there is no fear this is probably one of the most beautiful insipids and, and the beginning of a canto because it, it puts me in a very very um, relaxed mood um, you are almost uh, exploring um, an incontaminated territory and a, a place where at least incontaminated for you you have never been there and you have all the time in the world to look around and to satisfy your curiosity let's keep in mind that uh, in uh, at the end of canto 27 dante had uh, been told by virgil some sort of instructions of how to handle the garden of eden virgil had told him you are free you're going to be free to either sit or move about you can do either one and uh, the fact that dante chooses to move about like he's doing he's yes he's observing he's admiring everything but he's actually walking around clearly is there for a reason it's telling us that uh, his contemplative powers or skills um, are not fully mature yet so um, this duality that we've seen in the dream in Purgatory 27 with Leah and Rachel this duality between active life and contemplative life Dante is telling us I am still part of the I'm still taking part of the active life by moving about so much I'm not really fully uh, strong in my spiritual life enough to sit and enjoy the divine beauty. Un'aura dolce, senza mutamento, avere in sé, mi feria per la fronte, non di più colpo che soave vento. Un'aura dolce, senza mutamento, a sweet air without any variance in it. Even the pattern of the wind is perfect in the Garden of Eden. And then uh, he will explain why. What is uh, notable here is that his forehead is finally clear of all the letter P's and so there is this wind that is going through his face but it's very sweet and uh, that's all that is uh, his feeling is that it's, it's actually producing pleasure for him. Per cui le fronde tremolando pronte tutte quante piegavano alla parte u la prima ombra gitta il santo monte. I love here the fact that he's using the same verb that he is used in Purgatorio Canto 1 when if you remember he was describing the marine layer at, uh, at dawn one of the most beautiful scenes in Purgatorio and if you think about it the the movement of leaves in the forest where there are some sun rays going through this type of trembling of the leaves uh, visually is very very similar to the reflections on a, on a trembling marine layer and, and that's why he's using really the perfect term here tremolando which is also a little bit onomatopoeic if we want to say that but the images are kind of are kind of similar the trembling bows are uh, inclined in the direction of the morning shadows because this is to explain that the wind is actually blowing from east. It's always coming from east where um, symbolically, from a, a, a spiritual image point of view, we have God and we have Christ. So I really think this uh, canto should be read, uh, if it's read aloud, should be read very, very slowly with a very calming and, re and relaxed uh, voice. Uh, this part when he talks about the birds is incredible because now that we have been hit with olfactory sense, with our olfactory sense, with vision. Now Dante becomes uh, almost Beethoven with his sixth symphony because he's now creating a, a symphony, an actual symphony of uh, a harmony of the trebles with the birds and the basses with, uh, well, let's see what, let's see what he's doing. Um, he says, Non però da loro essere dritto sparte tanto che gli augelletti per le cime lasciassero d'operare ogni loro arte. The birds are free to express their art, which is singing. Ma con piena letizia, l'ore prime, cantando, ricevieno entra le foglie che tenevan bordone alle sue rime, tal qual di ramo in ramo raccoglie. In English, Mandelbaum says, uh, and leaves supplied the burden to their rhymes. In reality, 
what Dante, the concept is easy to understand. Dante is saying the, the sound of the sweet sound of the wind in the, in the leaves is uh, in harmony with the singing of the birds and it's creating a beautiful music all together. But this uh, uh, sound of the, of the wind in the leaves is actually uh, compared by Dante to a bordone. If you see this word at verse uh, 18, bordone, that was actually, it was literally the longest, uh, how do you call it? The longest, uh, the longest reed in an organ. So the longest and also largest reed in an organ, which is the bass reed. And, uh, and that's why there is this uh, con contrast between the treble, which is the birds, and, and the bass of the, of the leaves. It's so beautiful. And this reminds Dante of uh, the sound that the wind was uh, making in this uh, uh, maritime pines uh, woods on the Adriatic coast uh, near Chiasi, which is an area uh, close to Ravenna, where he obviously had, must have been uh, walking and enjoy na enjoyed the nature around there, um, where uh, when Eolus has set uh, Sirocco loose, this Sirocco was this uh, North African wind, and uh, Eolus, of course, the, the god of, of wind. Now, though my steps were slow, Già mi avevano trasportato i lenti passi dentro la selva antica tanto. Again, he is uh, repeating the term selva. In fact, I think it's the first time here that he actually uses the term selva, but he's repeating it from Inferno number one. So he, he really wants to highlight, I am describing uh, the same concept, the same type of uh, framework, but in a completely different light. Selva antica, the ancient, uh, ancient forest, that I could no longer see where I had made my entry. He is now deep, deep in the woods. And then I came upon a stream that blocked the path. There is a comment by a great Italian uh, Dante scholar. Her name is Anna Chiavacci. She says that uh, on verse 16, when Dante says le ore prime, l'ore prime, which uh, Mandelbaum translates uh, as uh, first hours of the morning, she says that uh, it shouldn't be read as ore as uh, hours, even if it does mean hours, but ore in Dante's times could also be taken for aure, A-U-R-E, aure, um, which would be the first uh, very light breeze of the morning. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, interpretative idea because if Dante is saying that, then uh, with full joy, there is uh, uh, it's not only the first hours of the day, it's not the first hours of the day that, that are singing in, in the leaves, but it's actually this first uh, morning breeze. So we have this incredible symphony of sounds and to which uh, we now add the, the, the creek, the, the, this little river where that has uh, the, an incredible transparency, the most transparent, uh, uh, that Dante can imagine. And although it moves uh, dark, dark beneath, it's, uh, it's not touched by the sun. It's in the, in the shade, but still um, unbelievably transparent in, uh, in its purity. I have to say, I've seen this uh, dark, dark at verse 30, 31, translated as brown, brown by Longfellow, because Dante uses the term bruna, 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 and it's true, while it's true that Bruna means brown, here I think it's actually wrong to use brown as a translation because he's explaining the color of this transparent, pure creek um, in the shade, but it, it still means that it is darkened by the shade, and not brown, the, the, the color brown, that to me at least doesn't really, doesn't really make sense. Then we get to verse 34, which is another very interesting one in the original Italian, because Dante says, coi piedi stetti e con gli occhi passai. Um, with, if it were a literal translation, we should say, with my feet I stayed, and with my eyes I went across. So uh, Mandelbaum writes, uh, I halted 
and I set my eyes upon the farther bank, which grabs the meaning, but is very different. Dante is saying that part of himself stood there, but also part of himself went across the river through his eyes. It's, it's a different angle, right? It's uh, incredible, the magic, of, the magic of language. Di là dal fiumicello. The fiumicello, it's, um, when you say ello or ino at the end of an Italian word, it's um, an, an affectionate, um, let's say, ending for a word. So it's not only small, it means uh, small, but also with a certain loveliness and a certain affection. And here Dante sees this uh, solitary woman, the Donna Soletta. Donna Soletta uh, means a solitary woman, but also Soletta, Etta, it has this other, again, this ending of the word, Etta, which is a, a, an affective, a, an affectionate type of um, meaning to, to the word, because the word itself, to, to say lonesome or lonely, would be sola, while Dante say, says soletta. And soletta uh, adds loveliness and adds a certain... Uh, it adds love. Yeah, I think that's uh, correct to say that it really adds love to a certain word. We saw in Canto 27 already that um, in his dream, Dante had already almost uh, predicted symbolically the fact that he's going to meet with two women. Um, first, this woman, who is Matilda, but we don't know her name yet, and then Beatrice. And uh, in his dream, he had Leah and Rachel, who, in a certain way, um, are referenced each to uh, each woman. And so Leah to Matilda in terms of the active um, life and uh, Rachel to Beatrice in terms of the spiritual life. But it's absolutely not as simple as this. The, first of all, I try to look into the actual meaning of Matilda as uh, an allegory. And uh, Dante scholars have been punching each other, kicking each other for centuries. There is no real agreement. Um, I believe the majority, as of today, say that uh, Matilda is, is uh, almost an, uh, a mythical incarnation of the Garden of Eden itself and therefore she is human happiness. She really represents uh, all the joy and happiness that can be reached on this earthly life, while Beatrice will represent something higher in, uh, in eternity, in heaven, uh, together with her meanings of faith and theology. But uh, Matilda is many things. She can be seen as the classical representation of happiness that could be reached through philosophy in Virgil's times and, and before, pre-Christian times. She could be seen as the primordial, primordial youth which Eden uh, represents in the Bible. And uh, all, she could also be seen as a new type of Eve from Adam and Eve. She's all these things and more. And let's remember how Dante operates. He is uh, always say many, many things with, with just one tool or one image or, or one verse. In any case, back to enjoying the beauty of, of the poem, uh, it's really beautiful when Dante addresses her and uh, there is a sort of uh, an erotic uh, tone in, that goes on between Dante and this uh, allegorical woman in, across the, the river because he, he sees love in her, he's very, very attracted by her, and when she turns toward him, she is following the behavior of somebody who is in love, uh, similar to the poems that Dante used to write, so, and Dante and all of his uh, old friends. So there is still, in Dante's behavior here, something that will have to be corrected, will have to still mature, he, he doesn't have any dependencies on sin anymore. He doesn't have addictions anymore to his sins. That's why he's clear of that. But he still needs to grow in his spirit and especially grow in his understanding of love. And if we think about the actual meaning of the Garden of Eden in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, um, which is, in my opinion, uh, one of the best books of the Bible, it's uh, so rich and complex and uh, 
sometimes I would say easy to misinterpret, uh, but we're going to talk about Genesis in the next uh, canto because there are more references there. But in particular, when it comes to the Garden of Eden, there is this sense of not only uh, the ancient uh, innocence of Adam and Eve, that's not all that we are looking at. When we're looking at uh, Eden, we're also looking at our own life as an individual. And as an individual, of course, we have our youth that is not coming back anymore. And when we, when we turn, we, we have the same feeling that humanity, the, the sinful humanity has when they look back to a sinless life or uh, in Eden of Adam and Eve. The classical references that Dante is making here to Proserpina, to Venus, to uh, Cersei and Leander. Leander was uh, somebody who was in love with uh, a woman and uh, every night he had to cross the strait of the Dardanelli I don't, I'm not sure how it's called in English, but uh, to go and, and visit her. So in any case, all these images are myths that uh, convey uh, love, but not uh, a really high form of love, more of a, let's call it romantic and erotic love. That's why I think, as I was saying before, there is still something in Dante that um, is not fully ready for a, a, a purely spiritual life. Even this hatred that he's feeling when he says uh, all this, uh, the river, he's hating the river because it's separating him from uh, Matilda and uh, his feeling is of hatred for the river. On verse 76, Matilda says, Voi siete nuovi e forse per chi orido, cominciò ella, in questo luogo eletto, all'umana natura per suo nido. So beautiful because um, she's uh, using the um, voi, which uh, um, it means you in the plural. And, uh, and so if the translation says you, it's still correct, but it doesn't directly convey the fact that uh, here she is referring, she is talking not only to Dante, but also to Virgil and Statius who are behind him. So when she says, you are new here and may because I smile in this place, she's talking to all three of them. It's only in the next tercets or two tercets below where she says, and you who has stepped forward, who beseeched me, tell me if you'd hear more that she is actually addressing Dante individually. E tu che sei dinanzi mi pregasti, dis altro vuoi udir, chi venni presta ad ogni tua question tanto che basti. Here at verse 85 is precisely where we can draw a line and say, okay, from from here onward, the second part of the canto starts, and it's the most uh, intellectual and uh, scientific one, where Dante asks a question. Uh, the question is, l'acqua il suon della foresta. I, I've been told differently, but what I see is uh, confusing to me. And the answer that he gets is uh, scientific in the sense that Dante intended science in, in his times by Matilda. We are actually confirmed that this is the Garden of Eden without any doubt by verse 93 where uh, Matilda says he gave men this place as pledge of endless peace. Beautiful translation here because Dante says e questo loco diede per ar a lui d'eterna pace. This strange word A-R-R -R, with an apostrophe stands for arra or caparra and this caparra was a legal term, still is actually, in uh, Italian law today, which generally speaking means a deposit. But uh, we can see this uh, sentence as God gave a, this place to Adam and Eve as a mortgage, as a mortgage on their eternal home, which is paradise, until they defaulted on the loan. This is what the game that Dante is playing with this word uh, ar or caparra. And uh, Mandelbaum translates it as pledge, which is interesting, but correct, absolutely. Um, Matelda explains to Dante here that, um, yes, it looks like there is weather in the Garden of Eden, but it's really not weather. It's some uh, divine phenomenon that is originated by the il, il, il primo cerchio, la, la, the highest sphere of heaven that continues in, in its rotation 
and in this rotation generates this, uh, let's call it divine wind, and the divine wind is uh, blowing always in the same way, always in the same direction. This is why all the leaves are moving in a similar way, in a similar fashion. And therefore, it's not proper earthly weather, because the earthly weather ends with the door, with the end of Purgatorio. So we are not in the, in the world of Purgatorio anymore. The Garden of Eden stands in a unique place, which is not fully earthly anymore. Uh, but it's, it's also not fully celestial, because there are still birds and trees and, and rivers. It's a, it's a very unique, unique place. Those ancients who in poetry presented the Golden Age, who sang its happy state, perhaps in their Parnassus, dreamt this place. In fact, both Ovid and Virgil sang about this Golden Age or Golden Era that um, was very similar, in some sense, to uh, a, a, an area and a geography and, 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 a, and a firm in time place like the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and that's what Dante is trying to do here. He's trying to say, well, like he's done before with other concepts, you know, the classical poets didn't really get there, didn't really express the concept of the, of the Garden of Eden, but they got really close, really close, almost. And that's what, uh, that's what he's doing here. This allows for the delightful, delightful ending where uh, we end with this uh, smile of both Virgil and Statius, they are now smiling. Um, let's remember the two pals, right? Virgil and Statius, they, they love each other's company and they're there. Um, they, Dante says, I turned around completely and I faced my poets. I could see that they had heard with smiles this finally, final choral is spoken. And that dawn, Dante turns his eyes back to Matilda. We will then find out gradually the role that Matilda plays and uh, we're gonna get to finally Canto 30th in a couple of cantos where uh, she will finally appear. Thank you so much for watching and uh, thanks for following these videos.